Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome all of you back to Ohio Exopolitics. I'm your host, Mark Snyder, and we're going to talk about the Billy Meyer case this afternoon, and then later on this evening I'll be interviewing George Green, and I'll post that show at a later date. I'm not exactly sure when just yet. I'm going to talk about creation first. I'm going to explain how thoughts can affect your appearance, as described in the Might of Thoughts book. We're going to talk about creational natural laws, cause and effect, how negative thoughts enslave us. I'm going to compare and contrast the material and the spiritual consciousness. Then we're going to talk about the hurricanes, overpopulation, the fires, and potential water shortages that are coming up. Uh, Edward Albert Meyer is a 80-year-old man who lives in Switzerland. He lives in a tiny mountain village called Hinterschmidruti, which is about 45 minutes east of Zurich. He's an incredibly prolific author. He's also taken some incredible photographs of ships what he calls beam ships in and around his home there in Hinterschmidt, Rudy. I think about 1,400 of them. He's also done multiple color films of these craft. Um, Colonel Stevens used to come over when he was still alive, and he brought an investigative team over to look into this strange and amazing phenomena that was occurring in northern Switzerland, Billy was getting visitations uh, starting in the mid-1975 by a woman named Sinyasi, who claimed to be a woman from another star system. She called herself a Playaren, and the the Playaren star system is beyond our Pleiades. They originally allowed themselves to be called the Pleiadians, but they're not from our Pleiades. They're from a different space-time configuration. So our universe, the material aspect of our universe, has seven different space-time configurations. And these human beings live in a different space-time configuration than us. Each one of these different space-time configurations is a variation in some ways of the other. For example, the Playaren system has a Lyrian system, just like we do, and a Cirrus system as well. So there are seven different space-time configurations in our material universe. Our universe is called the D-E-R-N universe. And these Playaren people are from our universe. And Billy's first mentor was a man named Svot, who was the great-grandfather of Simyasi. And he he mentored Billy for from about uh, when Billy was about five years old till he was about sixteen years old. He was mentored by this man named Sloth who would land his silvery pear-shaped craft in clearings near the forest where Billy lived. Billy lived in Bulak, Switzerland, in, in northern Switzerland, in a little village called Niederflox. And Spoth would land his ship and step out in what looked like a silvery diver's suit. He would take Billy up into Earth orbit and tell Billy about his future life to prepare him for his future life because 
in Billy's future life, he would be a teacher. And he was also told about his past lives when he was a teacher. And he, in his, the sixth most important lifetimes, I guess, um, he, his lifetimes of, as a prophet include the people that we call Enoch, Elijah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Emmanuel, and Muhammad. Now these people, uh, some of them had different names than we call them today. For uh, example, the letter J did not appear in the ancient world. So many of these people like Julius Caesar and Jesus were called by different names uh, when they were here on the earth, when they were actually alive. And Job, for example, is originally that book was called the book of IOB. Uh, and around 1550, Gian Giorgio Tarissino, an Italian scholar, was the one that really invented the letter J, and he started substituting the letter J for the letter I and the letter Y in certain manuscripts and writings, and that became a tradition that was brought forward. In fact, in the original King James 1611 version, it says, the testament of our Lord and Savior, I-E-S-V-S. There was a time during the Renaissance when he was called Iesus, or I-E-S-V-S. Today, he's, of course, called Jesus. Now, this is one of the earlier incarnations of the same spirit form that's alive today. We all, and this kind of gets into some of the topics that we're going to be covering uh, today, first of all, there is a universal consciousness, but the name God, this notion of a heavenly Father, is a falsification of the real truth of the situation. I'll give you a perfect example. I'll, get, I'll create an analogy for you. You could take a hundred people that are Christians believe in God, take them up to, on top of a seventy-story building. And each one of them that would jump off would splat on the concrete below or the sidewalk below or the road below. Now, a Heavenly Father wouldn't allow that to happen, but an impersonal spiritual energy, a universal consciousness would, especially if there existed something like reincarnation. And that's why these bad and terrible things are allowed to happen is because then the people that make these mistakes can evolve in future lifetimes to not do these kinds of things. Let me give you another example. War. I think something like 60 million people were killed in World War II. Now, there is a universal intelligence that is behind the evolution of our universe, but It's not a Heavenly Father. It doesn't intervene and stop our wars either. So the law of cause and effect exists in our universe. And there are other laws. There's the law of striving, that everything has to survive through striving. And that's part of the law of evolution. If you do not strive, you do not have any happiness. If you do not have evolution, you do not have happiness. Another law is the law of harmony, which says that our thoughts should be neutral positive. We should be in in harmony in our thinking at all times. Another of these creational natural laws is the law of love. This is reverence. This is respect. This is um, a very stable kind of love that doesn't change over time. Also, there exists the law of um, abundance and prosperity. That if you follow all these other laws, it will eventually lead you to abundance and prosperity. Now, the problem is a lot of people don't follow the other laws. So they don't get into a position of abundance and prosperity. Or, because as a society as a whole, our population is way out of kilter. There's 9 billion people on our planet. Uh, the, The creational natural laws in regard to population say that we should have about 529 million people for there to be large enough patches of forests all over to moderate our weather. 
But now we've destroyed much of the forests on the, on the planet, and now we have extreme weather, like the hurricanes and the fires. And this is why the Meyer material predicts these things. Um, so this is what we're, we're dealing with now, is that the people of the earth have to start getting up to speed on these things so that we can start to make better decisions I want to read a little bit of something that Christian Freiner, Christian in Switzerland, wrote in regards to the, the laws of creation. He said, if there is a mention of creative laws and commandments or laws and commandments of creation, respectively, the following explanations must be given to all those individuals who have already dealt in detail with the spiritual teachings especially with creation's existence. Now, the first thing he says is, since creation, the universal consciousness of our DERN universe, is not a person or some personification, quite contrary to the belief in God. Let me, let me back up here a little bit. There are many universes. Our universe in the Meyer material is called the DERN universe. It has its own consciousness. It has a universal consciousness. Now, the Meyer material says we have a parallel universe to our universe called the Tao universe. It's a different universe. It has its own consciousness. So there's a super intelligence behind the evolution of both of these universes. This is another um, law, if you will. Every universe has its own universal consciousness. And none of them are personifications. The the creation has no personality. In the German it's referred to as a Wesenheiten. And in that sense it has probably in some ways more in in common with certain energies and gases and and rocks and things like that. Because the universal consciousness, when it evolves, it it evolves under a certain schedule. In other words, its free will isn't in, involved in its evolution. With a human being, we have a free will. We may choose in one lifetime to kind of slack off a little bit, and another lifetime to push really hard for the evolution of our consciousness. But our universe will expand for 155 trillion years, and then it will contract for about the same amount of time. It's, it's very step-by-step. Step. It's methodical, almost mechanical in some ways. Let me continue here with what Christian's writing. He says, um, quite contrary to the belief in God, the Father by the various religions... And the creation is an impersonal spiritual energy or power. It creation never enacted any commandments that stipulate to human beings to do this or to do that. Now, this is where things get get a little complicated. Now, you can talk about the uh, Ten Commandments. Uh, the Meyer material has a very controversial perspective in that People, there were people on the earth in ancient times. They were, some of them uh, were extraterrestrial humans. They, and, and within that group of uh, extraterrestrial beings, they were very advanced in their material consciousness. They were advanced in their technologies. Some of them were very benevolent, and they kind of stayed out of, our, out of the way of the, the native earth humans and allowed them to kind of evolve at their own pace. And there was a group, a very negative group, called the Giza Intelligences, which got involved in the evolution of Earth humanity. Uh, they presented themselves as the gods, the creators of the universe. One of these individuals uh, is a, referred to as Jehovah in the... Old Testament, at least in the King James Version. And he was 
the one that destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, I believe he also was the one behind the genocide that's described in Numbers 31, where the J- Jerusalem killed all the Midianites, including the women and the children, except they kept uh, the virgins for themselves, about 32,000. So there was a, a strange activity going on here on the earth, which was doing a lot of damage to the conscious evolution of the people of the earth. Um, we are still affected by that today. Our universe, if you look at its physical structure, it has seven belts. And, and kind of if you would cut, you know, if you cut down a tree and you look at a tree stump, it has concentric rings. Where our universe is kind of that way, it it has seven counter rotating spheres. And the fourth sphere, the fourth belt, is where all the galaxies and the stars and the universe exists. Now, that material belt only exists in universes that are at the first stage of their evolution. And our our universe is a very young universe. It's at the very first stage of its evolution. That's why it has a material belt. The belt just before it is called Ur space. And it sends in positive energies in the, to the material belt. The belt just on the outside, the material belt, is um, a belt which sends in negative energies. And the Within the material belt, the positive and the negative energies combine and eventually form in matter. I believe the the outer belt is called the transformation belt, the one that's just outside the material belt. So this, this universe that we live in, we exist in, our darn universe is seven belts. It's 46 trillion years old, but there's a parallel universe called the Tao universe. It's parallel to ours. And one of Billy's mentors came from that parallel universe. She was a woman named Askit. And Billy met with her from, I think, about 1953 to about 1964. And she's the one that took him far below the Giza Plateau, underneath the Great Pyramid, where there were these cubicle constructions, which were about 73,000 years old. And that's where these Giza intelligences lived, uh, starting about the time, about 12,000 years ago, after the fall of Atlantis and Memoria, there was a whole genealogy of, of these leaders that lived uh, down there, and they had uh, initially there was about seventy three thousand of them. Seventy three thousand. The first one that took them underground was Arasame, a man named Arasame. He had two brothers, uh, one named Ptah and the other named Solom. And Ptah and Solom tried to stop Arasame from what he was doing. The first thing that Arasame did. Um, he killed his father, and I believe his father was named Jehab. And that's of the way these these intelligences typically come to power. They kill the, the ruler above them. They were people. They were human beings from another star system who didn't follow the spiritual teachings, who were here under uh, a kind of nefarious, intentions and they they caused the great damage here on the earth they got involved in world war ii as well uh the leader during this time was a guy named kamagal and i'm not sure if it was kamagal the first or kamagal the second there were two kamagals one of which must have lived an incredibly long time 
uh, based on some of the things that are said in the contact notes. But Comigal, we'll just use the generic term because, there were, again, there was a Comigal the second. But Comigal uh, influenced Hitler via uh, a person named Hermann Steinschneider who was involved in the Tool Society, the Fool Society. Uh, the Fool Society was a secret society in Germany that was trying to find Ultima Thule, which was supposed to be the capital of this uh, very powerful city that existed on the earth in the ancient times. And um, it, it was kind of a legend that was close to truth. Uh, according to Meyer information, there was a a city, so to speak, in the north during the time of Atlantis and Lemuria. And that city, that area, that part of the world was known as Hyperborea. And Hyperborea was an amazing place. This was before the earth was knocked on its axis. And I, Hyperborea had a, the best weather on the planet. It was better than Florida, better than Bahamas. It was like a perfect 70, 75 degrees all year round. There was, it really was no winter to speak of. They had all kinds of fruit trees there. Um, it was settled. It was eventually conquered by an extraterrestrial man named Eris the Barbarian who I kind of liken him to the first one in these Giza intelligences because his, his um, I guess you would say, many generation removed grandson, Iris the 11th, came back here to the earth after the war that almost destroyed the earth. See, according to the Meyer information, there, the history of the earth goes back much, much longer than what we're told in terms of the civilizations that existed on the earth. Uh, Atlantis and Nemoria goes back to about 133,000 years ago. And there were these were just extraterrestrial people who came here, people with very advanced technologies. Before that civilization, if you go back 150,000 years, was a man named Pelagon who who brought people here from the Pleiaren system, and he was very evolved, and he was benevolent and. His that civilization lasted for about 10,000 years. So there have been, there's been a kind of confusion here on the earth about the separation between understanding that there is a superintelligence that drives the evolution of our universe, but it's more an impersonal energy. It's neither good nor evil. It radiates love much like a star radiates light and heat, it it really doesn't have a personality per se. It, it doesn't operate like a heavenly father the way our religions teach us. So that's the beginning of understanding the creation. Um, it has a physical structure, to understand the creation, you also have to kind of study human beings a little bit. And one of the incredible things about human beings that we don't completely understand is the power of our thoughts. And as you know, I often talk about one of Billy's books called The Might of Thoughts, Macht der Gedanken, which teaches us how to think in order to utilize the power of our thoughts and how to think in such a way to keep our thoughts from negatively affecting us because our thoughts can can negatively affect us. 
And one thing that's strange about our thoughts is that they can affect our appearance. Let me read a little section from page 154. It says, well, maybe I'll start. And naturally, these kinds of wrinkles have nothing to do with those which come about as a result of the natural aging process and so forth. However, the truth is, is that many such wrinkles emerged through the misuse of thoughts, through foolish thoughts, through manifold kinds of self-created suffering, and through completely wrongly understood and wrong, wrongly expressed pride and so forth. The faces of human beings are formed in this way. Thus, in old age, one can have a face which in its appearance is like that of a young and still unspent human being, while others in their early years already display a face which shows extraordinary disharmonious contours and furrows, which are alarming. With the first, it is the product of a bright, happy, and harmonious world of thoughts, and a bright, happy, and harmonious psyche, with the second, the effects of wrong, negative, and self-pitying, unsatisfied thoughts. So, what kind of thoughts should we have? There are seven types of thoughts that's described there that are described in this book from about page 200 to about page 30, 230. You should tell yourself, I'm optimistic, I'm confident, I'm relaxed, I'm cheerful, I'm enthusiastic, I'm thankful, I'm harmonious. So if you can think in those terms, your your whole life will go better, your everything will be better, your health will be better, your thoughts can affect your health in negative ways. Um, it is the nature of thoughts that by their might alone, everything conceivable can come into fruition. So your thoughts eventually bring circumstances into your life. So you want to have good thoughts because from from good thoughts come good feelings. And good feelings lead to good habits. And your habits play a big role in the circumstances of your life. So it's so important to have these neutral positive thoughts. In fact, that's one of the laws of our universe of creation is that we're supposed to have neutral, positive thoughts. And through that, your consciousness will be like a garden filled with healthy plants and not through having a bunch of weeds that are, or negative thoughts because the person that thinks negative thoughts will soon allow himself to be controlled by them. Negative thoughts run automatically. And it is the automatic thoughts which create the critical point that causes the feelings to be disturbed. And when the feelings are disturbed, the psyche becomes disturbed. So you do not want to have Negative, automatically repeating thoughts, they produce pathways in the brain and you'll go, you end up going back to those thoughts. And so there's a cause and effect that goes on with your thoughts. When you have negative thoughts, the effect is a negative effect on the circumstances of your life, negative effect on your own body. So think neutral positive. All of the creation of natural laws deal with cause and effect. Uh, if you jump off a building, you're going to splat on the pavement. That's, that's a cause and effect. And we live in a nature of cause and effect. And we have to start accepting the, the fact that negative Thoughts can 
actually enslave us if we're not careful. And this is a cause and effect thing again. Let me let me um, read a little bit here. It says, however, whoever constantly tends, nurtures, and correspondingly lives thoughts of negation, of bad will, of stirring up trouble, of selfishness, as well as egoism or egotism, mistrust, envy, cynicism, thoughts born of being a wise acre, imperiousness, vice, and any other assartan, enslaves himself or herself and confines himself or herself to a self-created prison. So wrong thoughts, they run out of control so much that people can't, can't stop thinking wrong thoughts. So you have to recognize when you're thinking those wrong thoughts and start changing your thoughts, which is challenging. And sometimes you'll have to remember a good time in your life to get yourself back to a point of neutrality, to have a neutral positive thoughts. But any human being who above all thinks, tends, and nurtures that which is good, right, positive, peaceful, and joyful, free, and harmonious, and who is friendly in the correct measure to each and everyone, brings himself or herself in the abundance of the peace, the love, the joy, and the harmony itself. Whoever patiently learns the truth in correctness and makes the effort to form knowledge and wisdom in him or herself and to find also that which is good and positive in all things of life and all situation and events, as, as well as deeds and experiences and so forth, will acquire altruistic features as a result of which the gates of heaven, he's being, this is metaphorical, open to him or her as the old saying goes. And whoever thinks of peace, love, and joy, freedom, and harmony for his fellow human beings and all creatures every single day will ultimately bring all these values to him or herself in great abundance. And that's the law of abundance and prosperity. But if you think negative thoughts, you can be enslaved by them. And the negative thoughts rotate automatically. And that is something that I think we all need to learn to stop doing. That's a challenge. That's not an easy thing. I want to, if I can, um, talk about what's called the fulfillment of your duty to yourself. And this is talked about in the Way to Live book. It says, be honest, benevolent. Don't turn your back on yourself. Now, to be benevolent means to be kind-hearted, big-hearted, good-natured. So you want to be benevolent, but you do not want to chastise yourself. You want to have no self-abuse, no feelings of inferiority. No bitterness. So this is another thing um, that we have to learn in, in terms of correct thinking. A lot of times, and we all do it more than we realize, have feelings of inferiority. Those feelings need to be stopped. Fulfillment of your duty to yourself to have no feelings of inferiority. You should be gentle to yourself. On the other hand, you shouldn't flatter yourself. Um, You should care for the health of your body and your psyche. Do your best not to appear ragged. Don't dress poorly. Uh, You should challenge your body and your mind. You should be learning continually. You should also exercise your body. Don't devote yourself to your passions, to your lusts, your vices and addictions. Instead, use your intelligence, your rational logic... And if you do use your intelligence and your rational logic, then you will have enjoyment fulfilling your responsibilities. 
Always care for your health, your body, your psyche. Challenge your body and your psyche. How do you do that? By exercising, by also reading and learning. Whoever devotes himself to his passions and incessantly sets sail on their lusts and addictions finally runs through the smoldering desert dying of thirst. If you don't pay attention to your duty to yourself, you will decline, you will end in misery. Sometimes you will even have suicidal thoughts. And you cannot get respect from others until you fulfill your duty to yourself, to respect yourself. Don't do things, don't do hidden things that you would not do in front of a stranger. Always speak truthfully, openly, and unvarnished, even if others don't want to hear it. Speak the truth. Always think, feel, and speak in good form. Don't forfeit your self-esteem. Your clothes speak for you accordingly because you always form your exterior according to your innermost interior. So don't allow yourself to appear ragged, not even when you are hidden forgotten by the world. So just because you're hiding out in your home doesn't mean you should let yourself be ragged. I'm guilty of doing that. So I am learning, of course, right along with you all the time. Um, Let me read a little bit from the book here. It says... um, Unfortunately, the human being generally pays too little attention or no attention at all to his duties to himself or herself and to his or her own duties. And many human beings may ask in total knowledge what one's duty to one's self actually is. The question is answered thus. It deals with those duties which every human being has in regard to himself or herself. For example, that he or she practices and uses honesty. Or that he or she nurtures true benevolence, modesty, and humanity in himself and herself towards all life and so forth. In fact, the duties to oneself apply to the human being as the first and most important. Even when many do not recognize this or do not even intuit it. Unfortunately, many human beings simply live for the day without ever having thoughts about their duties to their self. So as part of the spiritual teaching, we must keep this in mind. No feelings of inferiority, no self-abuse, no no chastisement. Never lose confidence in yourself. You're, You're just as wise and skillful as others. Don't be in bad temper. People evolve at different rates and different ways. Never let yourself be controlled by desires. Never have the desire to be have the shining lead role. Avoid boredom. Boredom is the death of initiative. Boredom can lead to addictions and vices. Only very few human beings are are able to understand how boredom, self-centeredness, and the poverty of thoughts lead to a deteriorating inner nature. So that's one of the important things is fulfilling our duty to ourselves because if you don't, fulfill your duty to yourself. You can fall prey to these negative thoughts that enslave us. Now, one of the good things that the universe, the universal consciousness has done is it allows us the concept of forgetting 
and memories of the earlier life which might influence the new personality in such a way that a devastating confusion would come about. In other words, typically people don't remember their previous life, and that that's a good thing, because that could cause a devastating confusion. There, there are failures and difficulties that you've had in this life. Now, can you imagine if you could recall all the failures and difficulties of all your previous lives. Ah, oh, it would be horrific. It would impair your material consciousness to the point of insanity. So forgetting is a protection for the consciousness so that the new personality can develop freely. So, And, and, and you should not have feelings of self-abuse and inferiority because of any failures in this life. Anyway, so let, let me read a little section from 406 here. This is the importance of forgetting. At the latest, the knowledge about the earlier life, that is to say about the earlier existence, ceases to exist at the time of the rebirth. But why is this so? With a the rebirth, there arises a completely new personality which no longer has much of anything to do with the previous life. Now, it's interesting, though. I could go into that, but I, let me continue here. The new personality must lead a new life on its own, with its own new thoughts, feelings, ideas, and emotions, and so forth, in order to evolve as is pre-given through the creational laws and recommendations. Memories of the earlier life, however, would influence the new personality in such a way that a devastating confusion would come about, which would impair the material consciousness to the point of insanity. Memories of the earlier lives are therefore seriously burdening to the consciousness and thereby prevent evolution. So we really don't remember the details of our previous lives until we're at the, like the fifth stage of evolution. We go through seven stages of evolution. Right now, people here on the earth are at the uh, second stage of evolution, uh, generally speaking. So, so the law of forgetting is a wonderful thing that the creation has done for us. And you should also be able to not be tormented by any uh, difficulties or failures you've run into in this life. Don't be tormented by the death of, of people in your family or your loved ones. You have to be able to let that go. Their spirit form is very happy to get out of their body. Believe me. And yours will be too when the time comes. So that kind of leads us <laughs> to our next topic which is the material versus the spiritual consciousness. And this information comes from a book called The Psyche. And I read the <laughs> beginning of The Psyche so many times, dozens of times, to really uh, get this, get my mind wrapped around this. So, one of the, the great problems here on the earth is that we have many false concepts, many false... We've created a vocabulary of false thinking. The human being of the earth uses what are called false word concepts. And some of these are, for example, spiritual nourishment, spiritual property, spiritual illness. The truth of the matter is, your geist form, your spirit form, is invulnerable to harm. It cannot be ill. Only the material consciousness can be insane or ill. None of these ideas like spiritual lack, lacking or spiritual disturbance really apply to the spirit because it can't be sick. It can't be confused. It can't be deranged. It can't be faulty in any way. The spirit is said to be what's called in the German a Telstock, a noun which means a part piece. 
So your spirit form is a part piece of the creational spirit, so to speak. So your spirit cannot be sick or confused. It cannot be harmed by anything in the material world in any way. And there is something that comes from this spirit form called the swinging wave, schwingen wave in the German. These are periodically built up electromagnetic and electric uh, energies that are of incredible power. These are electric and magnetic fields that are that have immense power. And when we're higher evolved, we'll be able to literally utilize these. I think we we may do it to a certain extent now. Um, but our thoughts are so powerful that they can interact with these electric and magnetic fields. And, for example, one of Billy's contacts, Simyasi, could burn photographs with her mind. Uh, Billy is also said to be able to do incredible things uh, along these lines as well. It's, it's a normal evolution of the human being. It is normal. Now we have something called the psyche, which controls the thoughts and the feelings of the material consciousness. We have a spiritual consciousness, which is related to our spirit form. And there's a something called the gemut in the spirit that controls the thoughts and the feelings of the spiritual consciousness. Now the, the material consciousness is creative. So any, like all your, if you have a, a musical talent or if you're a writer or a painter or you do anything creative, that comes from your material consciousness. Now your spirit form is not really creative, which people don't realize. Now your spirit form never dies. It is kind of recording this, everything that happens in this life, um, it impulses you if you've learned to pay attention to it. It'll tell you if your thinking is right or wrong if you've learned to pay attention to it. It never sleeps. It never dies. Your spirit form, if you're a typical person on earth, is about four million years old. The spirit form comes into the body of a child 21 days after the sperm fertilizes the egg. And it brings energy to the whole body. It's completely neutral positive. It never is upset. And it's always always in balance. It... It's the real you in many ways. Your innermost self, your innermost personality is most influenced by your spirit form. You have a false ego as well, which is in conflict in many ways with the inner self because the false ego is threatened by evolution. By your evolution. So keep that in mind. I'll read something that says here about the gamut real quick. It says here, contrary to the psyche, the gamut of the spirit realm cannot be influenced by negative powers, such as negative thoughts. Your gamut, your spirit form, never have negative thoughts. Only by neutral positive thoughts will they be influenced. So the gemut is always in harmony. In the psyche, your material consciousness benefits from the fact that your gemut and your spirit is always in harmony. And the gemut actually supplies the psyche with these 
harmonious swinging waves that I was mentioning earlier. But the material consciousness can be negative or positive. And it has to to try to be neutral positive. The Gemud, it's just that way. It'll always be neutral positive. So our purpose in life is the evolution of our consciousness. And Simyase told Billy that love and wisdom go together and the creation and its laws are love and wisdom at the same time. So this universal consciousness, it exists in a perfectly neutral, positive state. It's it's never in fear. It's never in worry. It, I, I think, but like a juggernaut, it just keeps grinding forward in evolution for trillions of years. It never stops. Now, our biggest problem, our biggest overt problem, I should say, on the earth is overpopulation. And I know this is hard for people, and it was for me too, to really understand um, what's going on with, with, let me give you a few statistics. This will help. Just in India alone, about 4 million people are born on the street and die on the street every year. There are, if you get different statistics, I've heard as high as 11,000 newborns per hour. Um, The world population is growing between about 70 million to 100 million a year. It's astonishing. So what is this, how is this affecting the world? All of these, this incredible birth rate. For example, you have countries like Bangladesh, which is the size of Iowa that has about 167 million people in it. People can't get fresh water. Um, it's the pollution in most of these countries that have tremendous overpopulation like China, like Beijing, for example, it's sometimes it'll be dark in the middle of the day just from the air pollution. People have to walk around with masks on. They say the rivers in China, like in Beijing, are so sewage-filled, you cannot even stand to be around them. They smell so bad. Um, In Beijing... I think there's about 14 million people in that city. There's something like 52 lanes of traffic. And you can look this up on YouTube. You can see 52 lanes of traffic circling that city. Can you imagine? Um, what, that sometimes they have traffic jams that last for days and days. It's, it's ghastly. So all these people around the world, and the overpopulation is different in different areas. Um, it has terrible one of the things that is happening is the destruction of our forests and that's one of the ways that I've tracked down how overpopulation is causing these hurricanes and these fires now I'm just scratching the surface here this is probably much more complicated than I mean this is not even really covered in the Meyer material, per se. It it just, just talks about how overpopulation is our biggest problem and how it's so horrifically bad for the planet. But I looked into this trying to get a better understanding and trying to understand how the forests moderate the weather. Well, one obvious way is if you're in a, a forest like in my part of the country, (coughs) the temporal forest, the tropical forest, do this as well, where the vegetation becomes so thick that it produces a tremendous shade. So you can be 90 degrees in the summer, and then you can go into the forest, and it'll be 20 degrees cooler, where the shade is really 
thick. And this causes a stability in the climate because it cools down these massive columns of hot, warm air. Because a lot of these things like hurricanes, they come from these areas where there's all of this hot air. So this is one good this is one of the things the forest does. Now, when you have a gigantic human population, it comes in and we start all this deforestation. So we destroy our forests so we don't get that tremendous shade effect in the summer. Where our planet used to have gigantic forests everywhere, now we're constantly, with the bulldozer, which in many ways I think is as dangerous as the atomic bomb, the bulldozers destroy the trees, destroy the beautiful forests. Now, the forest also holds the heat in, in the winter because if you didn't have a forest, it would reflect back. Much of this heat and light would reflect back. If you had just snow and ice, it would all, all that energy would reflect back. So the forest is this wonderful mechanism which warms us up in the summer, keeps makes the air a little warmer. Uh, but in the, I mean, in the winter, it makes the air a little warmer. In the summer, it makes the air cooler. So the forests have this wonderful stabilizing effect on the climate. And because we don't know that, because we don't understand that, it's something we should in, we should almost feel. But we don't anymore. It's really something we should feel. And I think some of you out there, if you've ever seen a beautiful wooded area be destroyed to build apartments or whatever, you feel this sense of dread deep within your spirit if you've learned to pay attention to it. Because you know intuitively that this is a horrific thing that is being done. Well, that is happening at a tremendous rate all over the world. Well, folks, looks like our time's about up. I want to let you know you've been listening to Ohio Exopolitics. I'm your host, Mark Snyder. We've been talking about the Billy Meyer case, the book, The Psyche, The Might of Thoughts, and The Way to Live. Go to theyfly.com and get, some, get these books. You can also get them at the FIGU sites. Um, you can get... The contact reports at, uh, if you'll Google Billy Meyer Wiki, you, you'll get the Future Mankind site, which is also a great source of information. Have a great day. We'll see you later.